Okay, everybody, so here we are. We are in the very last lecture of this year, um, at least for 2020. And um, there's going to be two pieces of sculpture that I have a feeling could show up on the exam and two that I don't know for sure, but they're included in the units. So we're gonna cover them anyway. Might be a good idea just to jot some notes down over them, but just to, to have an idea about them anyway. So the first two definitely have a chance. The second two, not so sure, all right? But let's go ahead and look at context a little bit. So we have talked about architecture from the 1900s on. So we're talking about 20th century art. We've talked about art from the 20th century on. And we kind of stopped around with um, 20th century art. We kind of stopped around the 60s and 70s. So we're gonna do the same thing with sculpture, right? But the exact same things were happening with sculpture that were happening with um, the artists during the time they were really hitting the wall with doing a realistic image of something. Rodin had kind of turned sculpture on its head. Like basically at this point, if you were making anything realistic um, and like photo quality, the way it would actually look instead of neoclassical, you were gonna be copying Rodin. So you had to kind of start doing something different, right? And also photography is gonna be a big part of this. If photography can capture the world exactly as it is, then there's really no need for artists anymore to try to paint objects just the way that they are, all right? They're trying to change this a little bit. So just like with artists, these sculptors are going to be influenced by movements around them and this idea that art doesn't have to be objective. It doesn't have to actually look like anything or you can even break it down to the most simple abstract forms that are more organic, that don't have a name. So when we talk about organic forms, we mean forms of art that, that, that don't have a name. So we can't actually call this a cube. We can't call it a sphere. It's just got a shape to it that we're like, it's just kind of grew and developed. So you've got the human form and then you have you know, regular geometric forms. And then you have just these organic forms that don't look like anything. And that really is gonna be inspired by what these people see in primitive cultures as they considered it. Even though we not know they're not really that primitive, but just by looking at artworks from the Americas and Africa and saying, wow, these guys are able to convey a really powerful message with really simplified forms. Like it's not just what is being shown, it can represent an idea instead. So we're entering into modern sculpture where it looks like things of this time using materials from this time. Rodin was kind of a start in that. He was you know, trying to show things in a more modern way, even though he was showing a past event. But Rodin was a very modernist sculptor. Like he sculpted a lot of things that were modern. And people doing sculpture start creating sculpture out of things that people had never used before which was you know, kind of like the Impressionist painting in ways people had never done before and people using color how it had never been done before. So now, with especially with what had happened in World War I, you know, a lot of artists are kind of overseeing reality, just like the artists were. So they kind of want to move beyond looking at real and just kind of go into more of an idea, if you will. So when we get into early 20th century sculpture, um, we're going to see them kind of go through this revolution. It, the same thing we see in painting and then we see with architecture where it's, we wanna break the molds. They were tired of doing things from the past. They were tired of making things truly representational. And with all of this encounter they were having with African art and art of the Americas, they really liked this idea that a sculpture could capture an idea. It doesn't have to look like something. It, it can express an idea. So like, for example, with the African masks that we looked at, they weren't of a particular person. They were usually to convey an idea that was important. So that's what these artists are going to be inspired by. So I just have to show this artist because he's a really good example of what I'm talking about. This is actually an artist named Henry Moore, who when I went to Switzerland last year, I went to check out this little museum they had in Geneva and right at the top of the hill outside, there was a sculpture by Henry Moore, who's just definitely one of my favorites. And I'm not much of a modern art person, but I really like how he was able to convey an idea 
with just the simplest, most organic form. Like it's, he used modern materials like metals and he used just these organic forms that we wouldn't have a name, but we're still able to kind of identify the idea behind it. So like this one right here to me kind of looks like a spin on the reclining nude that we've seen, but he wouldn't be doing it for an idea or to show a nude person. He'd be conveying an idea about it. And Henri Moore, this is another one, was very influenced by the works of art that he saw in other cultures and from past times. So like this one kind of looks like one from ancient Greece, like the dying Gaul, but instead he's using just the most simplified form that he can to convey that idea of war or sacrifice. So this is this one is one that I really like by Henri Moore, and it's conveying the idea, in my opinion, of motherhood. It's universal. Anybody from anywhere in the world could recognize this is a mother curled around and protecting her baby. And it's just the most simple. There's, It's not a particular person. It's not got any extreme details to it. And on the left is actually a sculpture from um, Oceana, like in the Pacific Islands, where he was inspired by this, where it's like they are conveying something so powerful with just the most simple geometric forms. Well, he took it even farther and didn't do ge geometric. He did even more broken down of forms that don't really even have a name, but they're so basic and yet they still convey this very powerful idea. So these are some more by Henri Moore. Um, I just think he's really, really good at what he does with showing a lot with the bare minimum, essentially. So this is just another example of 20th century sculpture. This is actually called a horse um, in motion. So you've got basically this idea of wartime materials kind of replacing horse-drawn technology because once upon a time horses used to be the most powerful weapon that you could have it's what made a knight a knight but now you have this basic broken it down to the simplest form of a horse but because it's made out of these materials it kind of shows that the horse is almost morphing and changing into this tank in a way so the work of art for the 250 that they've picked is the kiss. Now we have seen a version of the kiss before, right? We saw it with Gustav Klimt where he was still using people and images to symbolically convey love, right? And this particular sculpture of the kiss on the left, so we're talking about the one on the left, is just taking it to another step of breaking it down to the most simple, simple form of showing this. And this actually has an influence of cubism where we're basically seeing all parts of it at one time. So on the right is Rodin, right? So this is a kiss by Rodin and Rodin was realism. Like he's, this is how it actually looks. It's two figures wrapped up in each other. But in Rodin's, you see two people kissing and you assume they're in love. But the kiss on the left is love. It is two beings made out of one block. That's it. That's all it took was just this one organic simple form that he used the simplest techniques to kind of create this idea of what love is. It's two people connected together in this kiss. And he even wraps their arms around the back. Like they kind of go at these angles and wrap around the back of it. So it's very, very cubist. And then the hair that he cuts the lines into, like he really didn't do much to this sculpture. He just kind of found it and it was there. And he created this idea out of the very basic. And if you look at it, the hair almost looks like we saw from archaic Greece where they had the braids in their hair. And it's almost like he's kind of saying that this is a tale as old as time. Sorry for Beauty and the Beast reference, but it's like this is something that transcends any culture. It's recognized by anyone. This one on the right, you can still kind of tell they're European, male, female. You can tell by their features. But this one, this speaks to anybody. Like it just conveys this idea. It's a universal idea that he has sculpted out of just one block. So this is the kiss by Brancusi, and it's just 
simple forms that they are breaking it down just like we've seen it with Vasily Kandinsky where it's you know the simplest forms are the subject like breaking it down to that tiny tiny just little bit of effort and it really shows what a kiss is figuratively but also literally so it's kind of like literally they're kissing but figuratively it's love and multiple multiple copies of this have actually been made this sculpture um, and this is one that was actually picked um, the person there's actually a couple and one guy came in to buy the original and he said I can't it's already taken and it was actually purchased for a um, a man who jilted a woman like he he stood her up he left her and she ended up committing suicide and he ended up um, putting this marker for her like this became her grave marker um, and he chose this kiss because that's what he thought their love represented and no matter that it didn't it didn't show them kissing it showed this idea of love and two people completely wrapped up in each other like even if you notice their feet overlap and um, Brancusi actually didn't even want whenever this was done he didn't want it to be put up on any pedestal because we do put love up on a pedestal and he's like love is just love it's love for everybody um, and it should be where everybody can access it. So even that this museum putting it on the wood there that you can see, he didn't really like that. So like when Rodin would make a statue, he would create a plaster mold and then he would create, you know, the sculpture around it. But Brancusi would directly work with this block. Like you can see, it doesn't even cut all the way through it. They're just completely combined. And the only thing that defines them is just simple lines. Like it just became very minimal. So think about what we're seeing in art as well. Like they've done the object, right? They've done it. They, they've shown people kissing. They've shown people in love. They've shown all these different love scenes. But now it's, okay, can we convey that with not having to make it as obvious? Can we make it more of an idea and minimalize it like we see in like African masks than just having to outwardly explain it to people. So eventually with sculpture, it's going to go the exact same direction. All right. Where we saw with Jackson Pollock, who did abstract expressionism, where his painting was literally how he painted it was the art. Same thing with cubism. All right? It's how it was made that made it art. That is this situation too, all right? We've seen that with cubists, we've seen it with all these movements, but then it gets to the point where these sculptures hit the wall. Like they literally go, okay, we have broken it down to where it's nothing representational. It doesn't look like any particular object. It's the idea in how it was made that is the art. So we get here to like Donald Judd with minimalism, but then you have nowhere to go because then you're just gonna be copying everybody. So like this, right? It's just blocks of wood on a wood floor. It's minimal representational as possible. And it has meaning because of how it's arranged and how it's created, but it doesn't look like anything. It doesn't look like an object. Well, eventually people are gonna wanna be like, okay, we need to go back to the objects. Like if you're gonna convey a message, you need to use the objects because these aren't overly like, recognizable like this was another one i think this is kind of cool these are um alexander calder he started making sculptures out of mobiles or mobile like mobiles that you hang up and like they kind of move and it becomes like moving sculpture and he would call it like lobster or something like that but it was more how he created it than what he was creating it and unless you appreciated that then the meaning was going to be kind of lost all right so then just like with art we start to see the object reappear where we have to use objects that people can recognize in art again that represent things right so we saw this with william de kooning and then we start to see it even more with andy warhol who uses you know objects as art to kind of make a point so that's what we're going to see now is kind of like this postmodern the object comes back but it you're playing with it right you're having you're not just painting the object the object has more meaning, right? So in this case, we have lipstick on caterpillar tracks where this guy was not sculpting 
lipstick on caterpillar tracks. He was using sculpture of lipstick on caterpillar tracks to give a deeper meaning. All right. Klaus Oldenburg, um, I really, really like him. Um, if anybody here is a fan of Clueless, the movie, um, and you see wherever um, Cher invites Christian over to her house, and they are um, looking around her pool at sculptures, and Christian goes, oh, Klaus Oldenburg, a very important piece. Like, he notices that her father is collecting Klaus Oldenburg, and what Oldenburg wanted to do is use everyday objects that people would recommend or recognize to make a statement. He actually had a background in commercial art, which means he was involved in sales, like advertising, marketing, like how do you create things that people want to buy? And then he really got his inspiration during the Vietnam War. And I just think this is really, really brilliant that he did this. So as you guys probably know, the Vietnam War was not very popular. And when the soldiers returned from Vietnam War, they were not treated very well. They were considered baby killers. You know, the United States had done some things that weren't considered very um, good. We were hated by a lot of the world and the soldiers were not treated good when they came back. Like it was, Vietnam became a very, very unpopular war and there were a great deal of protests against it. Like you've heard of Kent State, you've heard of these events where you know, basically the National Guard opened fire on people protesting the war and saying that they had the right to protest the war. And college campuses were a huge place where that took place. These educated kids who were in danger of being drafted, who were, you know, going, to, that's their generation that's fighting and dying. They were the ones that had a huge voice in it. So there were two things that he thought were absolutely ridiculous during this time. And one is the Vietnam War which was going on overseas. And then there was commercialism over here in the US, just this obsession with after World War II of making and selling stuff, all right? And just basically covering up here how bad things were actually over there, which lipstick covers up, like it covers up our lips, all right? So what he did is he actually created this um, sculpture, which originally the caterpillar tracks were plywood. And then the top of it was a sculpture with a balloon on the top that could inflate and deflate. Okay. Yes, the fact that the balloon at the top could inflate and deflate, right, and rise and fall did have a reference to masculinity. It was a male reference paired with the female reference of the lipstick. So basically war was manly, right? And that, and then at the same time you have the lipstick that was feminine, all right? So you have two different contrasts of things. So that's what he's kind of trying to show here. Just the ridiculousness of this, of what was going on at the time that we have this war going on that our men are fighting in and our women are back here buying and selling and putting lipstick on and covering it all up. Just like we're covering up the reality of how bad this war actually is. All right. So <laughs> you have this, this sculpture that he created and they actually put it on the campus at Yale which is a college campus in order to, and it was near the Dean's office as a way to, you know, protest the fighting of the war. So, okay. The way that the lipstick was shaped was meant to be kind of phallic in reference to male genitalia. Again, I'm sorry with the fact that the balloon could inflate and deflate. And at the same time kind of gives it the shape of a bullet but basically the lipstick in itself and covering all of what this up was killing people. So it was a bullet. Like the lipstick could be a bullet because we're covering all of this up. We're, you know, basically commercializing America while people are over there dying. So it's almost like our obsession with beauty covers up the ugliness of the war. And it was this huge statement that, you know, war was wrong and we were being too commercial and worried about selling and making things and covering it up than worrying about how terrible the war actually was. Now, eventually, lipstick on caterpillar tracks 
was made into a permanent installation. So today it's made of more permanent materials, but he had to start using objects because otherwise the meaning wouldn't be gotten. He, there, he had to use things that people recognize in order to make his point. And he's also kind of whimsical. He's kind of fun. Um, and I love that about him. There's um, some of his are in Kansas City on the front lawn in front of the museum. Um, the shuttlecocks over here on the right for badminton. Um, I like this one with the, the spade stuck in the ground. These are a couple others. I just, he's fun. Like just basically taking everyday objects and, you know, having fun with them and playing with them. Um, kind of like postmodernism, but at the same time, lipstick ascending on caterpillar tracks definitely had a deeper meaning. This one actually is outside the St. Louis Art Museum, and this is a Klaus Oldenburg. So kind of cool that we have one. Okay, going from weird to weirder, all right, we're, we're going to kind of get into the really bizarre at this point. Um, we started to see art that not only was so, so there were installations, like in an installation, you install a work of art into kind of a room or a space and people kind of become part of it, active as the viewers in some cases. So we have an artist um, here who, this is by Yayoi Kusama, and she's actually really popular today if you look her up. And this is after spending, she was big, like her name was up there as big as Andy Warhol. And then she, people started to think she was just crazy. Like she had suffered from mental illness and a very abusive childhood. Um, her So trauma really can lead to those kind of mental illnesses. And she ended up going into an art, uh, excuse me, not art, a mental institution for four decades, four decades. And only in the 90s, really, did she start to kind of come out again a little bit with her art. And she's obsessed with dots. Like dots to her are a very powerful thing that I won't get into because it's a really long backstory, but she likes to do installations um, that people can come and walk in and kind of become part of the dots. And because they're so cool for Instagram filters, she gets very popular now, which she would really laugh at because think about people who use Instagram. They're using it for their own popularity a lot of the time. Like not everybody, but like, you know, Instagram models and people who are inst you know Instagram influencers, they're using it for themselves. And I think that's just a perfect way to get into this, this work of art that she created. All right. So in 1966, um, she was not invited to participate um, in and exhibit her art in Italy, in Venice, at this biannual art fair that they had. And she was very upset by this because of the fact that she was like, you're basically only putting in works of art that people want to buy because it speaks to them. Like they don't really want truth. They just want art that they can see themselves in or that speaks to who they are and basically she was really upset that art was becoming commercialized that it wasn't for the artist anymore it was for the people people were creating art just to sell it not to make it not to make a statement but she was allowed to do an installation outside of the of the um, art fair she was allowed to <laughs> exhibit outside so she made out of cheap plastic 1500 mirror balls that she set up outside and she stood in the middle of them in a gold with red accent kimono in the middle of it because she is Japanese. And she started selling them these little balls for $2 a piece. So this art sculpture that she created became a happening because it wasn't just about the art that she created. The art was in what she was doing and the statement that she was making. Right. And the balls that were there. Right. Um, you could see yourself in them and you could see everything around it and it would reflect the art fair. And basically what she's saying is you can see yourself in the art fair because that's what you want, isn't it? That's what you're here for is to see yourself in art and it should be here for you. Well, here buy this. You can see yourself in art all day long for the price of $2, because really that's what this is about, isn't it? It's you seeing yourself in art. 
So here, just go ahead and buy these $2 balls of plastic, all right? This is one of her installations, and you can see that she's got this preoccupation with dots. So like this takes up an entire space, and there's mirrors in it, and you can kind of walk into it and become part of it. This is her recently. Um, here she is with one of her dot installations. So this was called, this is called Narcissus Garden, okay? And I'll go to this so you guys can see it. Narcissus is actually an ancient myth where a man loved himself so much. This is where narcissistic comes from, by the way, that you, you love yourself so much, you stare at your reflection until you your life passes you by and you don't go anywhere because you're changed over time, like you fade. And he turned into a flower, actually, kind of just rooted, staring at himself. So this Narcissus garden that she created is sculpture where she had basically broken art down to its basic form. It's a sphere, right? And it wasn't so much what the object was. It was what she was doing with it and the message that she was making. So here she is selling you your own narcissism. Like she's like, this only worked, this sculpture only worked if the the audience participated in it. And eventually they came out and kicked her out because she was making a very powerful statement and people were starting to go, wow, you're right. Um, I Art is becoming too commercial and I'm basically making it all about what I want to buy an artist or pandering to me. And she was like, well, I can do that for $2. Here you go. Here's a piece of plastic, all right? You can see yourself in it all you want to. Just take it home. And she had the sign outside that said, your narcissism for sale. And nobody before her had really used mirrors as an art form. So that's what makes her so modern is she's trying to kind of come up with something new. And here she is, Yoyo Kasama. Now today, she, I, I just wish I could ask her how she feels about this um, because there are narcissist gardens all over the place. I mean, they're everywhere. This is one in Central Park in New York. And today it's considered to be like the highlight of sophistication. Like it's an art form and the balls are made out of steel, not plastic. And they are um, a reflection of, you know, the society around it. And she's like, no, you're basically just saying, look, aren't we cultured because we have a narcissist garden? And that is completely not. She was rebelling against that of art being commercial. And here it kind of is. Just another one right here. All right, so the last piece that we're going to talk about, a new type of sculpture, is called site art, where it was dependent on the location and working with the location. And the example for the 250 that I don't think Narcissus Garden will be on the exam. I really don't, but at least you've heard about it, right? And I don't think this will be on here either, Spiral Jetty, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because it could. So let's just be on the safe side, all right? So site art wasn't so much about what the art was made of, it's where it is that is very powerful. In fact, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. is so powerful as a piece of site art because it connects um, two different monuments and it cuts into a hill where it almost looks like a gash. Um, in everything that we stood for, for democracy, because that's what they believed Vietnam was. Like, it wasn't about democracy. It was about pushing our ideals on other. And it looks like a scar or a gash in the earth, which is what it caused. Like, it caused a metaphorical and literal gash. And at the height of it, it is six feet tall. So when you're standing there, you are six feet underground. Like, basically the idea of a grave. It's very site-specific, right? So Spiral Jetty is an example of of site art or earth art kind of like actually the serpent mound that we talked about from ohio that's kind of the same idea um except this was all about we know what it's about because this was right when the earth day celebrations were beginning and this idea of protecting our planet and you know the green movements and showing that things decay so Robert Smithson, who created this, he actually did it in Utah, where the water is very, very salty, like the um, the Great Salt Lake, or the, almost like the Dead Sea. And salt underneath a microscope has kind of a curvy pattern to it. So when he did this, he had 
dump trucks come in and help push this basalt rock right here where the water meets the rock in so many different places and he really liked this area because it kind of has the the water kind of has a, re, a red color in this area almost like a um the algae turns kind of like a red color um so let's take a look at spiral jetty real quick In 1970, Robert Smithson hired several people to help him create Spiral Jetty. We're standing right in the middle, at the edge of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. But we're not seeing this the way that it existed when Smithson first created it, where it was an intersection between the land and the very odd water of the Great Salt Lake. This is a terminal basin, a huge lake that had been largely fresh water, but there is no outlet. So the water, once it flows here from rivers and streams, collects and then simply evaporates, which means that the water is dense with minerals. And especially with salt, very much like the Dead Sea in the Middle East. And this is one of a handful of these terminal basins that exist in the world. Terminal Almost nothing can live here. here. There like are a few fish here. that live at the outlet of some of the freshwater rivers. And, and there are brine shrimp and algae. In fact, there's a particular kind of algae that makes the water turn pinkish red. And that was true when Smithson created Spiral Jetty. But today, as we look out at the lake, it's blue. With help from the Dawn Gallery, which represented him, Smithson was able to bring a front loader and dump trucks, a tractor, to help move these basalt salt stones and sand and some soil into place. By creating a spiral, Smithson created lots of opportunities where the land and the water could meet one another. But right now, because the American West is in the midst of a drought, the water has receded and is at a great distance from this earthwork. So instead of the water filling the spaces in between the spiral, we have sand. So this was very much meant to be a work of art that changed based on natural principles. Smithson was interested in the idea of entropy, the idea of the way things break down, and his intervention in this natural landscape. It's an expression of the way in which artists have thought about the landscape for many years. We could go back to artists like Caspar David Friedrich, who thought about the overwhelming size and power of nature and the smallness of man. And that's certainly one of the themes here for me as we stand here. But we could also think about the importance of the vastness of the American landscape in 19th century American painting, or even its importance to the abstract expressionists in the 1950s. We can go even further back and look at the artwork of indigenous peoples in the Americas long before the Europeans arrived the geoglyphs that are known as the Nazca lines in Peru, in South America, or the earthworks that come out of the Fort Ancient culture in North America. And in fact, the very shape of spiral jetty is a form that has shown up in petroglyphs throughout the American West. And it's a form that appears in nature quite frequently. One of the anecdotes that Smithson apparently was aware of was the centuries-old idea that the Great Salt Lake contained a whirlpool that somehow connected it to the Pacific Ocean. So the idea of a spiral or whirlpool is active even in these stories that predate Smithson. But this is also a sculpture that is rooted in the 20th century in an industrial culture. 1970 was the year of the first Earth Day, and that signaled an important early moment in the environmental movement. The idea of the ruination that man was visiting on nature is clearly informing work like this. And Earth Day being this time when we reflect on environmental issues, but the relationship between the growing industrial nature of the United States and the, the amazingly beautiful, vast virgin landscape that was here when Europeans arrived is a theme throughout 19th century American painting. And as we stand here, we see mountains. We see this basalt that's formed from a volcano. So we have a very powerful sense of the passage of time that I think was very interesting to Smithson. By putting art outside in the world, it becomes part of the process of nature. It can't be conserved. In 1970, this was still a radical idea, the idea of taking art off the wall, bringing it outside, outside of the confines of a home or a museum. And thereby outside of the commercial of a work that could be bought and sold. Smithson was 
interested in creating a porous relationship between that more controlled gallery experience and the experience of art in the world. So can a work like this also exist in Manhattan? Can it also exist in a gallery? Well, we did drive two hours from Salt Lake City. So one does have to make an intentional pilgrimage to see this. We're really in the middle of a vast, empty space in the American West. And yet this artwork was not conceived of as existing only here. There's a video, there are aerial photographs. And so like many works of art in the 1960s and 70s that were ephemeral, they exist through their documentation, although this still exists here also. And I have to say, I wouldn't feel as if I had experienced this work of art fully had I not come out here. Standing here looking at Spiral Jetty and being really aware of how different it is than when Smithson created it in 1970 really makes me think about museums as places where we entrust works of art. We lock them away from time. We conserve them and create special conditions to stop time from hurting them. But here, Smithson created something that time is supposed to change. Museums, in a sense, try to do the impossible, which raises a really interesting question. What do we do with the significant work of art that was intended to change over time? This work of art and the land that it sits on came under the control of the DIA Art Foundation. What does an institution like DIA do with something like this? Does it try to protect it? Does it allow natural and industrial forces to play with the landscape around it? And so what DIA did is, in concert with the Getty Conservation Institute is to make the decision to regularly document this object. You mentioned this idea of entropy, which was so important to Smithson, this idea that the tendency of all things, according to the laws of physics, is to move from order to disorder, to chaos. And I think we have that sense of things coming apart here. So Smithson is imposing geometric order into this natural landscape, into this vast space that is in the process over millions of years of disassembling. But here, more specifically, we can see the way his intervention is slowly coming apart. And I think that sense that over millions of years this will come apart makes us aware of the brevity of our own lifespans in the grandeur of time. So this is, like they mentioned, a really good example of site art. It's site specific. And when they talk about site art, they're also talking about art that is not in a museum. Like just we get past the idea of just creating art to sell or for patrons and let's get art out there for a bigger purpose to make a meaning like Klaus Oldenburg did or Yayoi Kosama. And this is truly that interaction of, you know, humans interact with this. You're meant to go out and walk in it. And for a long time, it actually was submerged. And then they had a drought and it appeared out. And actually the drought is still there and you can still go walk on it. And the DIA Foundation that is in charge of this is very clear. You take nothing with you, not one stone, and you leave nothing behind. Like you don't touch it because it is decaying on its own, which gives the greater message over time of, you know, things decay, things become part of the earth. Um, there was a lot of very powerful messages to this. So here it is. You can see it. The great, it's a uh, spiral jetty at the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And I did um, AP grading for three years in Utah and never actually went to see the spiral jetty. And I'm kind of bummed that I didn't, but I didn't really want to take a bus for that far. Um, so 15,000 um, foot spiral from the earth made out of basalt. Um, and every angle that you look at it, it changes. You know, just like life changes. So every angle that you move, it can it can change. And eventually it was it was put here because eventually it would erode and things end here. So it's a terminal basin. So um, you can definitely see how sculpture was starting to move outside of just the traditional norms and actually going what was in front of them and how they could take it out of a museum. All right, that is it, everybody. We are done with the artworks for 2020. So we are now ready to start reviewing and getting ready for this exam.